Uh, good evening, everybody. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here on territory that was part of the great dish shared by the neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The Canadian Clay and Glass Gallery is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land ceded by the Crown to the Six Nations that includes six miles on both sides of the Grand River. It's now my pleasure to introduce our curator, Sheila McMath. Hi guys, thanks for being here tonight. Uh, because I was unsure if I would be able to be here tonight, um, I asked Jane Byers to come to introduce um, our artist tonight. Uh, as you all know, Jane Byers is a celebrated artist and knows Zachary uh, from an exhibition that they had together in 2016 called Hang On To to today and lose tomorrow um, at an artist run center in Saskatoon. So uh, both Jane and Zachary are represented at Paul Petro Gallery in Toronto, and it just made sense for me to have Jane introduce Zachary. So I'll turn it over to Jane. I'll just uh, mention, is this a good spot here? I'll just mention another connection with um, with Zachary and I and, and uh, Waterloo, that the person who curated that exhibition was Taryn Hughes, who was a student at uh, the University of Waterloo in the Fine Arts Department, so she was a student of mine. And when she went to Saskatoon, she, of course, got to know uh, Zachary and his work, and she thought that, you know, we could make an interesting show together. And we did, neither of us knew each other's work at the time. It's Canada's big place and filled with a lot of different artists, so. Anyway, so it's been, uh, a very fruitful friendship. So, <laughs> so it's, been, it's been a thrill having Zachary's wonderful work here as, as part of the 25th anniversary show. And it really wonderful to have him here tonight to talk about the influences and, and uh, inspiration in his work. Zachary is an honest to goodness prairie boy. He was born in Saskatoon and now lives in Regina, and, uh, but he's, uh, you know, always happy to come home to Regina, but he does spend an awful lot of time on the road. Zachary has had exhibitions, done residencies and projects all over the world. I'm talking about across North America, Europe, Asia, so he's very, very busy with his work. Um, and Zachary is part of this then, now, next, show that that's, Sheila curated for the 25th, 25th anniversary. <laughs> um, the, uh, and one of the uh, ideas in the show is, is to capture the, the work of artists that have, have been, uh, that are very accomplished and have been uh, significant, that working in some way with clay or glass. Uh, but at different points in their career, so some of the artists are very senior, and um, some of them are uh, more uh, in the uh, mid-range. And, and then the next part of the show is uh, uh, younger artists that represent the next generation. And so that's the, uh, what Zachary's part of, of this show is. And his work uh, is very much uh, part of a, of a new, kind of contemporary art that is a very fluid practice that includes a lot of different media methods and processes. So in his work, even what's here in the show, but there'll, there'll be more that he'll be showing in his uh, images, that he works with a lot of different media, including painting, drawing, uh, performance, installation, and of course ceramics. So this is, uh, you know, a, a new way of looking at uh, how artists are, are working with uh, materials like clay and glass, that it's, it's part of their practice, but it isn't uh, the only material that they work with. And Zachary's a wonderful example of that. It's, it's a very exciting development, I think, in terms of using uh, ceramics and, and glass. And I think the gallery here, because of the space, and because of the curatorial direction that it's taken, it's been a very welcoming, very inclusive space for this kind of work that is uh, leading to some, some very exciting uh, new ways of looking at, at these kind of materials. So uh, we're thrilled to have Zachary here, and I'm really looking forward to 
to hearing what he has to say. So welcome, Zachary. Oh, thank you. What a lovely introduction. Thank you, Jane. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah? OK. I usually don't have a problem uh, projecting, so we'll see how this goes. Um, I don't know if the projector is on. Can we see the image? Yeah, okay. Let's kill the Ish. <laughs> there we go. It's emerging. Okay. All right. So um, I, initially, when I um, when I was thinking about giving this talk, and I've never given a talk sort of from the perspective of uh, ceramics, I talk about ceramics in my. Um, broader practice, but I sort of wanted to make more of a focus on ceramics. So that will be the case tonight, but um, I realized that I needed to set a context. So there's still quite a bit of drawing and um, pro probably predominantly drawing uh, and painting um, and some installation as well, along with uh, the ceramics in the presentation tonight. So. Um, This is just, um, I'll actually talk about this piece a little bit later um, in the talk. Uh, I'm going to go to the next slide and talk a little bit about the body, uh, the male body in particular, and um, uh, my body, uh, which became uh, the sort of sole focus for um, quite a period of time. And I would say probably still is um, the focus of my work, uh, central theme surrounding um, my body and the landscape and my body as a, as a, as a queer body and uh, the politics of that. Um, this image is called Gulliver. Uh, this is a work from my uh, undergraduate, uh, just, just after my uh, undergraduate degree. Um, and I was working with um, a really wonderful uh, Saskatchewan uh, artist, uh, mainly a, a drawer. Her name is Alison Norlin. And we did this show at, uh, at the Mendel Art Gallery where they would uh, pair up emerging artists with established artists and um, some, somehow uh, create a, a work or an exhibition. And so um, Allison really just uh, um, pushed me to um, amp up my scale uh, and also uh, my uh, references to the male body. Uh, so this is the only image, I think, maybe minus one or two others. Um, where it concerns um, other people's bodies. So the work that I was doing in my undergrad was, um, was really about uh, questioning uh, accepted ideas of masculinity and um, ideas of masculine bravado, in particular um, when related to visual culture uh, and the history of images of the male body. Um, and so this... Uh, image of Gulliver from, of course, from uh, Swift's Gulliver's Travels uh, as the image when the Lilliputs are crawling all over and, and tying down uh, Gulliver. And so for me, I had this, um, after reading the book and thinking about the, uh, the imagery, um, in the text, I sort of um, switched and, and uh, undercut the, uh, the initial narrative and added in a, a, a sense of a, a, uh, an erotic uh, undertone, obviously, or <laughs> in this case, overtone. Um, so this is the type of work that I was doing uh, in my undergrad as I moved into my master's. And actually, Allison, again, was quite instrumental in, in getting me to think about my own body um, as opposed to images of other uh, bodies. So these images are, you know, they're, they're sort of created uh, from, uh, you know, reference to um, biblical stories, uh, famous literary uh, stories or tropes from stories that uh, for me are informative about um, masculinity and storytelling. And so for, um, for the buildup of these images, I would just sort of um, 
source things from all over the place, from the internet, um, you know, pornographic images or, you know, vintage images and just sort of reassemble them and create worlds. Um, so that's, uh, this series of drawings is called the circumference drawings. Sorry, and in my um, first year of my master's, again working with uh, Alison Norlin, um, she really pushed me to uh, um, sort of do some self-examination, um, which I was very reluctant to do, but um, I'm really um, happy that I did listen to her uh, guidance. Um, and this is the first self-portrait that I did. So I moved uh, into oil painting, actually. Um, previously, I had been working in acrylic and trying to get acrylic to do what oils do naturally. And, um, also looking at a lot of, um, of paintings. Um, so uh, painting is, uh, and, and you know, the history of painting and, um, and mainly you know, images of, um, of the male body in, in Western art history. So be that um, neoclassical paintings, um, political paintings, or religious paintings, which are also political paintings. Um, and how they uh, situate the male body. So obviously in these images, I'm, I'm undercutting that idea of, of masculinity. So here I've just taken off the pants. So the, the, there was a, quite a bit of humor I, I, I felt um, that also um, undercut the, the nudity in a way or, or made it more accessible. So this, the, the title of this piece was um, which people always say, always on the batting for the wrong team, whatever, whatever that exactly means. Um, but also, I was really interested in the space that that uh, Manet created in this particular painting called Le Fief, and uh, this strange sense of space um, that that occurs, um, very very sort of um, nondescript space that's really defined by a strange awkward shadow under the one uh, foot. Otherwise, the body would be entirely floating. So I really like that idea of space. And I was thinking about bodies in space, in particular my body in space, and uh, the sense of the, um, I guess, uh, trying to create a liminal space, a sort of nowhere space. Okay. So um, as you can see, as a scale reference here, the scale of these works are scaled to my body. Um, and they're, you know, the, the space in them really suggests uh, a sense of, uh, narrowness or really lack of space, and uh, you know, I was I was researching through um, yeah through image and through uh, t for through book alone um, a lot of neoclassical painting and and just sort of um, taking some of the um, I guess the closeness of bodies um, and the um, construction of space and then you know making it sort of absurd and using everyday objects um, that I would interact with. And, um, you know, I, uh, the Sobeys bag, which doesn't quite say Sobeys, so I don't get in trouble. But everyone knows it's Sobeys. Um, and socks and shoes and sometimes hats. And so there's a lot of, um, a lot of play on, on the body and the representation of the body. And I think my interest in, in the body and in the male body course has to do with my own uh, my own sexuality coming to terms with that and also coming to terms with living in a place like Saskatchewan which can be um, you know somewhat isolating um, and then reevaluating you know what I had learned from art history um, that really interested me um, sorry moving ahead um, this one is called uh, mouth, mouth breather so again really trying to um, uh, also undercut um, the sort of um, homoerotic imagery and, and add humor to, um, you know, thing, references of other artists who, um, you know, whose work is explicitly about um, the sexual act and, and um, that sort of objectification of the male body. So playing with that as well. And I felt using my own body, um, there was a, sort of this, um, obvious closeness, this sort of psychological um, depth to the work, and I had to really reconsider how I was presenting the male body because it was my own body. So did I want to, you know, configure my body bent over with my, uh, you know, with certain things exposed and what, how that would um, 
uh, present. So again, a lot of references to uh, art historical sources here. And then, and, and really the costuming that's, ha that's going on here is just uh, uh, objects of clothing that I would wear. Uh, also, another, another thread in my, in my interest in, in the male body and uh, images of, of um, masculinity probably relate back to the fact that I was raised Roman Catholic and I saw a lot of images of, of um, uh, Catholic saints and, and Christ figures. Um, and a lot of them uh, were very beautiful. They had very beautiful bodies, um, and they, um, th there was a, this strange mix of sex and torture in, in a lot of the images. So, you know, for instance, I'll just slip to the next slide here. Um, you have Saint Sebastian, who has an arrow through his neck, but he looks like, um, you know, and an arrow through his leg, and uh, so it's a pretty, you know, terrible things going on with the body, but the body still looks very much alive and living and thriving, so there's this sort of strange thing going on visually. So again, I just sort of play with those motifs, so, and, and try to imbue a bit of humor as well. Um, so these images, I'm gonna go back again. These images, uh, well, I can tell you my mother didn't like them, that's for sure. Um, because again, it's my body, and you know, there's, there's um, I was actually researching a bit of um, at, like accidents where people actually survived. So like this man fell um, and he was impaled through, well, there was one man who was impaled through his brain and he actually lived. And it was like a, a, a I can't remember what the, the wire is called, but he fell from, a, um, I think he lived another seven years and then he sort of, um, he, um, he had, many uh, cognitive issues and then he passed away. But so I was, I was thinking about these sort of traumas um, and sort of relating them to the traumas that I found in um, saint uh, imagery uh, and just sort of apply them to myself. Um, the only one that really, really bothered me was the, there's um, right here, I'll just point to it. I can see it. But it's a bone exposure. So the, the, I'm really pushing that I, the idea of the, of the injury, but again, the face uh, in the upper half of the body is sort of at odds with what's going on with the rest of the body. So I find that very curious and interesting and, um, and I, I question that a lot as well in these works. And then also this, you know, this is, this is another um, bodily uh, strange uh, distortion and this is by, uh, the, the odalisk on the top is by Ang. I always say that wrong, Ang. Um, and he actually, uh, for the purposes of visual sensuality, although to me, when, as soon as I realized what was going on, or as soon as I read that this was the case and then saw it in person, it, it, felt very, it looked very grotesque to me, but he's added in um, vertebrae and he's elongated. Um, and if you look at the, um, the, the leg or the hip and then there's the knee over top, it's the most bizarre distortion. Her, it's like she's holding her leg. She's detached the leg underneath and put it on top. So those sort of strange distortions that are really meant to push that, the, that sense of uh, the sensual or the sexual, but really it is this like complete monstrosity in a way. Um, and, and kind of referencing that in the image, but also again, you know, those are my uh, Andy Warhol limited edition shoes and my tank top. So I'm just like, um, yeah, playing with absurdities. And then, uh, you know, continually referencing art history, even um, con more contemporary works. So in, in uh, 2009, I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to travel to Paris uh, for the first time ever. I had an exhibition um, at a gallery um, that ended up representing me for several years in Paris. Um, and of course, on that trip, I went to all of the uh, major museums, and I realized this, the oddity of the fact that I'd been referencing all of this neoclassical work um, in particular, and never having seen any of them really, I'd, I'd had one trip to New York prior to this, and saw you know, um, saw obviously New York is, is packed with great art, but uh, it was at a different point in my in my life and my learning. So I realized uh, after 
um, the experience of viewing these works that I need to go back because they really are physical experiences. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people now in the sort of world of, of Instagram and, and online things, my friends who live in New York, and I'm like, go see this show for me because I can't, and tell me about it. And they say, oh, well, I didn't get to see that, the Caravaggio show, but I read about, I read about it. I read the article that you sent me. I'm like, no. I saw the images online, but it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a strange thing, but. Um, so what I did was I um, devised a plan to go back and um, I uh, got a, a grant from the Saskatchewan Arts Board and I just, I went back and I, um, I didn't know what I was gonna do, but I knew that I needed to, um, I needed to research um, the works that were in the, at, at the very least, the, the works that were in the Grand Hall of, of the Louvre. So works by uh, David and, and Ankh and, um, Jerry Coe and Delacroix. And uh, I just sort of sat in the gallery. I was there for three months, so I think the first two weeks I just sat every day and just, um, you know, took it in, breathed it in. And then I started to notice uh, it, amongst these massive compositions um, that were usually, again, about um, male bravado and um, war and uh, despotism and death and destruction, there were these intimate moments of uh, male. Uh, male and male, male on male touching, uh, and, and usually um, hands clasping or overlapping or bodies sort of intertwining. Um, and, you know, these images are, um, <clears throat> you know, about Napoleon's spoils and, and they were the political tools of their time, right? But there's these s strange and beautiful moments of uh, male intimacy. So I just zeroed in on those. Um, and I did many, many, many studies, and I've recently shown them for the first time. I had never shown them before. I showed them at um, DC3 uh, Art Projects in Edmonton, and they have a really beautiful, massive space, and they were able to accommodate the painting that, that uh, went along with this series. Actually, this, I consider these drawings um, sort of autonomous works on their own, um, but they are studies of um, you know, zero, zeroing in on um, small s sections of much larger compositions. Um, and then what resulted was this um, much larger um, painting, and that was, that was really the, uh, the point of this project, was to go and do some research and come back and do something on this sort of monumental scale um, that included my body in um, m multiples. Um, so I'd, dealt with multiples before, but not on this scale. Um, and so really, I used the, uh, the, the smaller uh, compositions and my thinking and reflection on those compositions and created this painting called Beautiful Losers that hovers somewhere between you know, absurdity and, um, and I think the mundane, I guess. You know, I, I mean, again, it's um, often um, the case that I'm just, you know, wearing my everyday clothing and hanging out with my cats, and uh, that's who's in there, or my sister's dog, or uh, <laughs> things that were in my studio, and making subtle references to um, to the paintings themselves, and also to the smaller drawings that I was doing, so the research. Um, yeah. And that, that also, on that residency as well, um, I was invited to, uh, through the gallery uh, that I was working with at the time, I was invited to be part of a really wonderful collaboration with a, with a really amazing um, French photographer named Sophie Cal, who, someone who I researched in my, in, in my master's and was really interested in her work um, and her dealing with the, um, the personal and the private um, and, and the body, and she often includes her own body in the conversation. So it was real, um, pleasure and honor for me to work with her. But it was a very strange collaboration in the sense that I never met her <laughs> and I never talked to her. So she's, a, a, I think, a, a rather um, private person. <clears throat> and she basically just gave the, uh, my gallerist five photographs and she wanted them sent through email and I was supposed to choose one of the five and somehow respond to it viscerally. So um, I chose this photograph, this really strange uh, and beautiful photograph of this Marian sculpture that has jackal ears. Um, and it's, 
uh, you can't really see the image, but it's, it's being, um, it's been broken and it's being held together by um, a bunch of um, elastics. So I, you know, given the instructions, I just thought about, you know, what would, what would it be like uh, to have my head sliding off? And at the time I had long hair, actually even much longer than it is now. Um, and I just pulled my hair down and I started photographing myself, you know, tying my head together as it was sort of imagining it sliding off. Um, and so that's actually another thing I should say about um, a lot of the imagery. A lot of the imagery, um, excuse me, and even the, um, the references for the um, ceramic works, they come from uh, photograph, uh, photographic images. So, uh, you know, for, for a painting like, or a drawing like this, um, I just sort of sit in my studio and set up my camera and, and, and just sort of pose myself in many different ways and choose something that I, that I find um, represents the idea that I'm, um, I'm looking for. So this work, um, I don't know, it, 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 uh, I feel like it was a, a seminal work in many ways in, in that I started to really question um, the exclusivity of my body and um, the sort of frontal um, posing and the confrontation um, that was part of the narrative and, and how maybe I wanted to, to shift that narrative. So um, another thing I'll say about um, about my practice is that I'm I'm often I've done I've been very fortunate to do a lot of residencies, and they've been also very formative. So I'm I'm really informed by by space and by place um, that my body is in uh, at a at a given moment. But I'm also always thinking about home, thinking about Saskatchewan. So in that sense, Jane, I am very much a prairie boy. <laughs> It's always in there. Um, so this was a residency I did in Tennessee, <clears throat> and it was a, a residency um, that was, again, another, like I said, a very transformative uh, experience. So this was the, the, uh, in 2010, so one year after my Paris residency. Um, and I did have a project that I was uh, working on, um, working towards, uh, and that was um, an exhibition that I was invited to be a part of at um, Concordia's FOFA, um, FOFA uh, gallery. And that was being curated by um, the photographer Evergon. So he, um, he was curating this exhibition that was in conjunction with another one um, called Doug Times 27. And it was a, a, um, a photographer who had been photographing uh, his partner um, for 27 years. Um, and, and all of those photographs, all those portraits were being presented. So he curated in the exterior spaces um, uh, domestic queens. So it was an exhibition exploring um, relationships of men uh, living uh, together in a domestic situation. So um, I was there and I'm uh, not exactly sure what I was going to do, but I had a 30-foot you know, vitrine to work with. So I knew I was going to do something quite large. And I you know, instantly became... Um, deeply affected by the, by the space. I don't know if anyone's been to Tennessee, but it's, um, well, Ontario is pretty lush, but it's, I, I would say, even more, more lush. It's subtropical. It's um, um, the insects that exist there are, you know, like the drag queen versions of the insects that exist in Saskatchewan. So everything is fluffier and brighter and, <laughs> and, and well, and different, you know, and, and um, you know, I think the, the creatures that are in Saskatchewan are equally as beautiful, but very foreign. You know, this felt very uh, different to me visually. So I was um, very affected by, you know, what I was finding in Tennessee and also the seclusion. I was very much alone in this massive place. There was another writer in residence, but we, we sort of hung out and drank bourbon at night, but we were sort of alone during the day. So I was doing a lot of exploring. And, you know, there would be like families of turtles just, you know, strolling by. And at night there were... There was like this cacophony of sounds, and there would be like um, uh, the, the the toads would show up because the moths were there, and then the you know the lizards or the small rodents that were eating the toads would show up because the toads were there. So there was just this, this like whole anyway. <laughs> I was very affected, but I was also thinking about Saskatchewan and the drawing that I ended up creating, which is called Vignette. Um, ended up being a, you know, a, a sort of standard portrait in a way, a, a portrait of my family. So it was myself and my husband Ned and our two cats. And uh, I was looking at a lot of uh, vintage images of men together. 
And often these images aren't necessarily of, of, of men in, you know, in, in a living situation, you know, in, in, a, in, uh, in a marriage or a sexual relationship, but they were, um, you know, pre-Oscar Wilde or pre a certain period, men would sit together and hold hands or even kiss or, you know, hold, uh, ho hold an object together and be posed together. Um, after a certain point, the images of men posed like that disappeared um, at the turn of the, you know, the last century. So I was looking at a lot of those imageries and, and I found them very, very romantic. Regardless of what the relationship that these men were in, there was this sort of beautiful engagement. So that was uh, what I was um, thinking about in terms of posing myself and my husband together. Um, but I, I sort of created this magical space, I guess. Um, and it's the first time that I combined um, you know, bodies and, um, and other um, animal bodies together with plant life. Um, and the plant life is actually, it's also another first in the sense that um, when I build up a lot of my images with, um, with plant life, it's images of plants from you know, many different places. This was the beginning of that. Um, so it was images specifically of plants from Tennessee, plants and animals that I encountered and photographed and plants and animals in Saskatchewan. So I you know, took these two spaces and melded them together really and, and in a sense created a, um, I was thinking of a you know, prelapsian sort of idea of, of space and time. So inside and outside of time. And then flanking that much larger image were these two uh, smaller works. Um, and this is also the first time that I, that I uh, use uh, blue pencil. And it is actually also related to my interest in, in ceramics, in particular in Delftware, and the idea of a, you know, small domestic objects that might hang on your wall. Um, so uh, these were images of the, of the apartment that we had just moved out of um, and the apartment that we had just moved into. So it was really about our... Um, and at the time, we were, we were sort of feeling very... Um, out of touch with, a, with an actual private space because rents had jacked up in Saskatchewan and, and in, in Saskatoon in particular and gotten very expensive and we had to move you know, three times in, our, in the period of um, like eight months. And so we were feeling very unsettled at the time. So these were sort of a, an exploration of our actual lived experience and then the, the other drawing was sort of a more um, magical or metaphorical space. Um, so at the same time, I'm thinking again about how to um, reconfigure the body, but also starting to think about my drawings as objects. Um, my drawings are already objects, but objects that aren't just on the wall framed uh, and a particular scale. Uh, and so this is um, a body of work uh, called Trauma and Other Stories, and it, it was... Um, Exploring the body um, in, in a form of uh, transformation um, and, and pushing the multiple even further, the idea of the, the multiplied body and the multiplied self. Um, so this was really about how um, insult uh, transforms the queer body. Oops, sorry. I also moved, I should probably talk a little bit about my, my, my move from painting to drawing. Um, the immediacy of drawing really um, is uh, compelling to me and, and um, is sort of in, important um, to the process of my work. So I moved to drawing uh, primarily for that, uh, for that reason. Um, and started to work a lot more with blue pencil um, and with um, the material of mylar. So again, a lot of these images are you know, art historical or from literary references. So this one, uh, this drawing is called uh, Tower of Babel. And then this one is called Go to Hell, one. Um, and then these, uh, these two images are um, in reference to you know, images of, of bodies sort of tumbling into hell from you know, Northern Renaissance and uh, Flemish paintings, um, in particular Van Eyck, um, but I sort of um, neutralizing in a way by using the blue, um, and I th and I believe also the number. Yeah. So when I did this drawing, um, I think there's thirty, um, no, thirty one or thirty. So it was when I was thirty, and I did thirty versions of myself, one for every year of my life. 
sorry. Also from that series was, um, I, I did a, a grouping of drawings that were, were based on words and text and, and about things that people had said to me. And, and I used red pencil because uh, for me, referencing the idea of correction. Um, so uh, this, this one is, the title of the works is, are also um, what the text um, that makes up the drawing is. So uh, the title is Don't Be Gay. So it just is it's that phrase over and over and over and over and over again, and it, it's what builds up the image. And it, was, it came out of a, um, a visit that I had with, with an artist um, who basically said along the lines of that my, my work was too gay. It, I needed to tone it down. <laughs> And so I found that um, troubling and homophobic and, and also strange because he also identifies as a queer man. So it was a really odd experience and it ended up um, one of these works. And then this one um, is called 26 Months um, and again linking to words um, uh, and to f names being called or uh, to insult. Uh, so the word that, that is the text that makes up this drawing is faggot. So it's just that, that word over and over and over again making up the image. Um, and so I wanted to, I wanted to um, use that word in relation to uh, an image, image of innocence. So it is a portrait of me at the, at the age of 26 months. And then this last work from this series is called um, Stick Man. And this was, this drawing in particular is related to the story of Daphne. So Daphne and Apollo. Um, and of course Daphne was, oh, how does it go? Um, she was hit with a gold arrow by Cupid and I believe Apollo was hit with a, or no, Apollo was hit with a gold arrow. Uh, Daphne was hit with an iron arrow and the gold arrow um, signify that you would, the next person you would see you would fall madly in love with and the um, iron arrow you would despise the next person you saw. Well they saw each other so of course Apollo starts um, um, running after, you know, basically trying to ravage Daphne and she begs her father uh, for help and he transforms her into a laurel tree. So it's, um, it's a story about, for me, about, um, it's a terrible story about confinement and so really it's me transforming myself into a, um, into a piece of driftwood and just sort of uh, laying. Um, it's also a further um, extension of the idea of, the, of drawing becoming sculpture or my interest in presenting drawings in a, in a different way. And this is from another a, a, a sort of concurrent series of drawings called Disappearance. And, and my body continues to sort of change uh, and disappear. And again, a lot of references to art historical uh, imagery. So that's a um, Holbein uh, portrait with carnation. So I'm taking the same pose and I'm holding a carnation, but I'm being completely sort of usurped by the landscape. Um, and then this, um, this drawing, uh, which is called Emperor's New Clothes, um, is related to a story that, and then uh, images that were sent to me f uh, by my cousin. Um, they, uh, him and his wife had gone to the, um, to the Mariposa in Mexico and, and saw this um, amazing sight of um, the butterflies, the, the monarch butterflies that move from uh, southern, um, southern Canada all the way down to Mexico and um, they were describing you know just so many insects on a given uh, on a given branch so many of these monarch butterflies um, and it's at times can happen that there are so many butterflies on a branch that the branch breaks off so you can imagine that um, it's quite fantastic and I also had the opportunity um, with the same couple um, to birth monarchs and to feel, actually, as you're birthing them, uh, as they sort of come out of their cocoon, because um, of course they're, they're, they're lessening in numbers, um, and so there are a lot of people um, who are part of this program of birthing monarchs, and they sort of, they um, make a sort of safe place for them to, to grow and hatch. And so when you birth them, um, 
you have to um, help them sort of strengthen their wings and just basically hold your fingers like this and they sort of put pressure from their wings uh, and you can feel that. You can feel the pressure and the strength in this tiny little creature. So I was imagining my body being engulfed to the point of a limb falling off and that was sort of the drawing that I, um, uh, drawing goal I set out for myself. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a very taxing drawing, and I almost stopped at halfway. <laughs> but I'm glad I pushed through. Um, and so again, this was a metaphor for uh, you know confined sociali sociality versus the natural phenomenon of the of the mariposa and, and the obliteration of the the body via you know um, a, a natural spectacle, I guess. So the next year, I went on another very um, formative residency and exhibition project in Vienna this time. Um, and I, I started you know, researching a lot of the collection, of course, prior to going there, but also while I was there. Um, and I started a new series of drawings called uh, the Natural Drag Series. So these, of course, are, are based on the artist um, Archambaldo. I'm just going to skip ahead a slide. Is everyone familiar with his work? So 16th century. Um, Italian painter, but um, I've always loved his work and his work in person and also in, you know, in, in print prior to seeing it in person seems incredibly contemporary. It doesn't feel like it's, you know, it could be in, in many different uh, periods or times. Um, and so I also liked that idea of the body transforming, which is um, something that I was already started to become engaged with. Um, in other works. And so I did this drawing that was sort of a, um, it's a silhouette of my body, uh, but made up of uh, vegetation, plant life. Sorry. And this was the, the counterpart uh, to the green man, which is the wild man. Uh, and the wild man um, is, you know, the wild man and the green man for me are, you know, outsider characters. So they're this idea of the, the embodiment of nature or um, the natural world or that idea of encroachment pushing, uh, pushing that even further. Um, and these are about, you know, adornment, the idea of adornment and camouflage. And so these are, these are wild men, green men, or wood woes um, found in architecture, print, and textiles. Um, and, you know, there are different versions of the wild man in, in every uh, European culture. Um, and, yeah, for me, they're not, I mean, they're, they're representative of an inner wildness, I guess. They're not um, divine, um, but they're other. They're sort of in between. They're a, a liminal character. And so I sort of take and adapt them, um, again, using my own body. Oops. And I also encountered this other uh, wonderful um, mythological character from, um, I believe he's um, Czechoslovakian, uh, called Leshy. And Leshy is a little bit different than the Green Man and the Wild Man, a little, little bit maybe more um, dangerous to uh, to humans. So he's a forest protector. So if you uh, maybe killed an animal or um, cut down a tree or something like that, he would, um, you would get punishment or, you know, receive some sort of punishment from the Lashy character. So it's another um, sort of more ambivalent character um, that I explore. So that was Leshy, Leshy 1, Leshy 2, Leshy 3. So I work in series. Um, so I'm, I'm able to say I'm never done with, um, with something if I want to revisit it. Uh, and this one is called Pink Man. And this one um, is called The Woodsman. And so this one I did on a, on a residency actually much later. Um, at Wave Hill, uh, and Wave Hill is a botanical garden. I think I have an image, I might have an image later in the slide uh, show, um, in the presentation. Um, and I did it in the winter, so it's a winter, it's called Winter Workspace Program. So it's a, um, a public garden in New York, in the Bronx, and it's uh, 
open year round, but in the winter, in the summertime, they have um, they have pro like uh, exhibitions, and in the winter time, they all turn into uh, studio spaces. So um, I was it's invitational, uh, so I was uh, suggested to them and and received the residency, and I ended up in the most beautiful room. And it really is uh, American History X because it was a it was a space that was owned by either owned or leased by Mark Twain, and I was in the sunroom, uh, which was you know would have been Mark Twain's sunroom. Also, was owned by the Roosevelts, and then at a certain point, the family um, gifted it to the city of New York. Um, and there was another another space that's called the Glendor House, um, and then there are these beautiful um, botanical collections that are indoors year round. And then of course there's the there's the grounds. So they've um, it's temperate and temperate enough there that they have a lot of um, uh, a lot of species of plants that grow, uh, you know, in Japan or in, in other um, more temperate climates that can survive there. So it's really beautiful year round. And I started getting really affected again by the landscape and by what I was seeing. And it was a lot of, you know, very colorful roots and very, very different the winter there, I tell you, than from Saskatchewan. Everything is snow covered for six months or, or ice covered. Um, so there's still a lot teeming and a lot going on, and, and I just started thinking about the circulatory system, and, and so that's how this image built up. Okay, so um, I don't know if you can see the slides very well, but I'm going to start talking about um, a series of tapestry works called the Eunuch Tapestries. And this was the precursor to that, um, this image called Midnight Garden. Um, and of course it was, again, based on um, paintings, um, at particular Caravaggio. Um, and I'm thinking again about, um, about space and about bodies in space, but I'm sort of shifting the narrative and the body um, is a lot um, less important, I think, in this imagery, my body, which is still present. Um, so uh, also the Saskatchewan landscape becomes a lot more important um, idea of uh, liminal, a liminality, liminal queer space. So I sort of adopt the ditch. So the di ditches that are sort of, that run the, um, the sides of the roads here in Ontario, of course, but um, in Saskatchewan, you know, the, the, the farm, uh, the farmland in Saskatchewan is very sort of geometric and rigid and, and the space is, uh, you know, in, in entirely, uh, of human construction, the way that you know even r rural areas are not really you know in in a sense rural. They they're constructed to um, to make food for humans. So there are these tiny little areas along the sides of the roads that are teeming with um, with a lot of uh, particular plants that are hardy um, that people like to call weeds as a derogatory. Um, which I find very ironic when people talk about plants being invasive. <laughs> Someone, you know, a human being saying a plant is invasive is very ironic. Um, so, and they're, they're you know, they're, they're self-concerned. These plants are, um, that why is a weed a weed? It's, a, it's deemed a weed because um, it has no human purpose, but it still has very, a very real purpose. So in a sense, that, um, that plant also becomes a stand-in for, uh, for, for queerness or for resilience. Um, and they quite populate these images. And again, these are, uh, these are also similar to the vignette piece. Um, the, these spaces are being built up um, by plants from all over the world and also in Saskatchewan. So they're, they're, they're fictive spaces. And, the, and I'm interested in, in um, two specific types of space, uh, art historical spaces. So the, the flattening of tapestry florals um, and that sort of vacuum of, of blackness or depth that, um, that one experiences from Baroque painting. So sort of fusing those two spaces and creating uh, <laughs> another space and other space. So the drawings are, uh, they, they, 
materially, I really want them to reference the ephemera of tapestry um, and the way that tapestry, tapestries age, but also the way that they're installed. So again, I'm thinking about these as objects in a different way. And uh, this is a piece that the Mendel, well, formerly known as the Mendel Art Gallery, now the Remy, uh, they, they own this piece. So when they were uh, considering buying it, I. I talked them into um, framing it in a very particular way. So this will never be covered with glass. Whenever it's shown, which probably means it will very rarely be shown, but whenever it is shown, it'll be, it'll be set into these shadow boxes that I had made for them, um, which are very heavy, um, beautiful wooden boxes, essentially, that they just sort of sit into and get pinned into. But the idea of the, of the, of the tapestry and of the, the hanging um, and the sort of object nature um, I wanted to really um, reflect in the installation of them. So here is the, um, what this series, of course, is based on, the unicorn tapestries. And I guess it, it, my title um, for the series is the Eunuch Tapestry, so it's a play on unicorn. Um, and I guess I become the stand-in for the unicorn and I, be, I am the eunuch in the work. Um, but what I'm striving for is a sort of um, democracy in the images. So um, I'm no more the image of me, which is usually somewhere. Uh, and actually, in a lot of them, um, there's no uh, there's no body. Um, but I'm no more important, and I'm not represented any more. Um, I'm not drawn any more um, in depth than any of the other plants or animals. So there's. Um, there's a, yeah, there's a visual democracy that I'm aiming for in this work. And so I've, I've hung them in many different configurations, um, sort of close to a wall, and then I've built frames for them and, and hung them, you know, quite far away from a wall and created an installation around uh, the fountain piece that's, uh, that's here in the exhibition. And then the, I, I also have uh, very specific flowers and plants and spaces that I go to in these works. So um, this is a flower that I'm um, obsessed with called Detura. Does everyone know? Does anyone know this plant? Yeah, okay. Well, it's incredibly uh, poisonous to humans, all parts of it, um, but it's very beautiful and it, it blooms at night. So it's called a, a moonflower is one of the many terms for it. Um, it's also been called an angel's trumpet. Uh, devil's trumpet because it has, I think, in the past been used uh, to um, to induce um, abortion. Or uh, so it's a it's a very potent uh, and it has a long uh, history uh, engagement with humans or humans with it. Um, but it's very dangerous. So it blooms at night and it actually like throbs open within like a you know three to five minute period it's in, it's incredible and it has this wonderful scent and then by the morning it sort of just droops and then it creates these beautiful seed pots so I'm totally uh, enthralled with it and then also thistles and there's a particular thistle thicket that I go to every year and it's in Saskatoon on the south side of the river right behind the University of Saskatchewan and it if you can see on the um, the photograph there it it grows like 13 feet to 15 feet high in the air, and you can just like walk through it. I mean, I would wear pants, maybe in a long shirt, but, um, and so it's just this really uh, magical uh, space. And here's the winter drawing that's uh, in the gallery as well. So yeah, a lot of these actually don't have human presence, um, but, but I, my idea about my belief when it comes to um, landscape is that before you've, um, you know, when you look out at a landscape and you decide you want to depict it somehow, um, you've already put your body in it or it's already in you, you know. So that's one of the other, the other sort of uh, main points of my work is that we're not separate from the landscape. We are just one aspect of it. Um, and so this is Eunuch Tapestry 5. This was a specific project for the Leslie and Lohman Museum uh, in New York. Uh, and they have a very large vitrine space, and they asked me to fill it with a work. So I did a 25-foot drawing, um, largest in the series, uh, in panels. Um, and it's now uh, owned by the National Gallery, I'm very happy to say. 
Um, so I guess in terms of compositional buildup, um, these, these works are constructed like, like a Dutch still life. They're fictive. Um, so they're observational, but, but they're also fictive. So uh, in the sense that um, Dutch still lives were, were never, um, you know, the, 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 the blooms that are blooming um, and going into, uh, going into decay, they would never be blooming at the same time. So it really is a construction of space and time. And that's also really what these, um, these unique tapestries are about. Uh, I'm going really late, so uh, <laughs> I'm just going to uh, speed up a little bit. But um, this is another series uh, a formation of the wild man. So again, I'm thinking about queerness in nature and camouflage and protection, confinement, adornment, um, and usually taking the form of my body hair, facial hair. And also, I should talk a little bit about the color blue. Um, and for me, it's ties to, um, to, to melancholy and also to magic um, and to the surreal. Um, there's a really great book about blue that I would suggest everyone here read. I think it's called Blue, a Biography. Uh, and it talks you know, a lot about um, the peculiarities of blue uh, in relation to, uh, to humans and to perception. And just even to the, the emergence of blue uh, as a material for artists to use. And a blank slide, okay. Um, so this was another series from the, that sort of fed out of the wild man. Uh, it was called the feeding series. So I was thinking about that voluntary interaction or again, sensual encroachment of other species. So. And the act of someone, you know, going to a park to feed a bird. So this, I was just thinking about, you know, what, what would it be like to be fed by a bird as opposed to feeding a bird? And just thinking about um, switching roles, shifting things. It's also kind of St. Francis-ish. <laughs> Speaking of Catholic imagery. Um, and then it gets maybe a little more um, intense. I don't know if birds all over my face like that would be overly comfortable. And then insects. And I was also thinking about the, um, the practice of um, death masks as well. And then I did a series as well called the Vanitas that really deal with um, death um, quite abruptly, visually anyway, um, rebirth, um, the idea that, yeah, the faceless or the, the face as a mask, um, and the Vanitas series mean, re in reference to um, Dutch Vanitas, where there's always a skull, um, which is sort of a reminder of mortality or of certain death, and so the skull in these works is my face. And another series of drawings called the specimens, um, which are creatures that explore hybridity, diversity, and queerness, transforming continually, and having like this sort of endless uh, potentiality for change and adaptation, I guess. And I'm also really, again, like I said, interested in drawings being presented sculpturally um, and the potential for um, mylar um, to be like uh, folds of paper that you can sort of see through uh, the back side of um, and have a different experience of a drawing. And really they become about memory and time overlapping. Um, and again, weeds featuring centrally in my exploration of queerness, sort of marginalized plants, if you will. And then I'm, I'm, these I'm sewing together just with uh, linen thread. And they're actually, they're quite delicate. So, you know, people can walk by them and they just sort of fall, oh, sorry, they just sort of fall over and then they sort of stand back up again. So it's that idea of weeds just sort of doing that in the ditch. Um, and shifting perspective. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's also so many idiosyncratic histories within the ditch. You can talk about so many things, um, you know, in, t in talking about plants and where they 
um, where they originate. You know, I mean the the dandelion, which you know came over um, in colonial times, or well, we're still in a colonial time, but um, those sorts of ideas about space and time that relate specifically to plants. And so I started thinking about, again, I had another really um, remarkable experience in, in Athens and seeing the Acropolis Museum and seeing all these beautifully, um, beautifully made terracottas and um, works that had been um, buried under the ground that, that still had color, that still had um, paint on them. Um, and so I started thinking about how I could sort of transform the ditches into uh, th three dimension and just started playing in my studio with clay. Um, so this is where um, the clay um, exploration began really. Um, and I made these little plaques that I sort of hid away and I had a studio visit with, with um, Wayne Bearwalt, who's now a very good friend of mine. Um, and he, I had, yeah, I put them into a drawer and I, I went in the house to grab coffee and I came out and he was rooting through my stuff and <laughs> found them. And he said, what are these? And I said, I wasn't going to show them to you. And he said, no, I think you, I think you should really continue to explore. These are quite interesting. And I like this, this space that they create and that they suggest. So I, I reluctantly carried on and I had no place to, to, to fire them. So I thought that they were just going to be um, a thing that I did and then um, hid them away. But actually, Wayne suggested that I do a, a residency. At the time, he was the director of the IKG uh, at um, uh, Alberta College of Art and Design. And so he formulated this year-long, and it ended up being a year and a half, a long residency for me where I could come and go. Um, and Calgary's not that far from Saskatoon where I was at the time, so I was able to fly in and or, and or bus in whenever I wanted to. And really the aim was to create some sort of installation that we showed in the exhibition, um, which was two years uh, ahead of when I started the residency. So these are the plaques uh, that I'm calling them plaques. Um, called Hanging Garden 1 to 5. And at some point I will continue uh, with some sort of motif. I'm thinking about uh, wreaths. And that moves into um, the largest project that I've done in ceramics to date, which is the fountain, so Fountain 1, which actually was constructed to be uh, functional. So it's got a, it actually has a hole in the top, and that was there was going to be a water pump put into it, and it was going to to sort of be somewhat functional. And I decided it's more functional without water, <laughs> more functional being non-functional, so metaphorically uh, functional. Um, and, it, and it really is, uh, I became very fascinated with, with this particular clay, which fires to a really beautiful bone color. And I started to think about bones and the absent body. So again, it comes back to my body and this sort of um, brittle bone uh, matter that sort of builds up over time. Because this is a time-based piece that every time I show it, I show more. Um, so this is um, this image of, of the base of the fountain uh, when it was, before it was fired so well, it was greenware. And really this was how it was supposed to be presented. Um, and then something happened in the kiln and I transformed my project and made it. <laughs> Changed it. This is one of the things that's really fascinating for me about ceramics is that I have to give up all. I have to give up control, which I don't do with my drawings in, in the same way. Um, and it's been really transformative. And I've learned so much about other materials um, by delving into ceramics. Um, so this is me at the at the residency working on the piece. And this is more or less. I put these images in because this is more or less how. It was supposed to be before it went into the kiln. And after coming out of the kiln, I had to make major changes that actually ended up making it a much, much stronger piece. So this is some of the, the, the visual reference that, um, that's related to the fountain in particular. This is the grave of Oscar Wilde, um, which uh, when I went to Paris with it on the first, uh, the first time I was there, uh, we visited his grave uh, in Père Lachaise. Um, and on approaching it, I thought what I was coming up to, I thought what, you know, what was sort of on the grave was, was red moss. So there's red and green and yellow moss all over the place. 
And as I got closer, I realized it was actually mouths. So it was people putting lipstick on or had lipstick on and they were kissing the stone, um, you know, as a, a tribute to Oscar Wilde, which I just thought was so beautiful. It was such a beautiful, um, it's such a gorgeous monument to, be, to begin with, but then to have this as a practice, of people going and visiting and actually kissing the stone, it's just, it's such a beautiful, uh, beautiful thing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the family, um, which at the end of Oscar's life was estranged from him, um, his, their descendants have decided that this is a travesty, so they sandblasted everything off of the raw, <laughs> off of the monument, and they covered it with glass, which is the real travesty. But people are fighting back; they're just kissing the glass. So the, <laughs> so you can't really see the monument anymore because there's this, you know kiss marks. I was back in um, last year, and I saw it covered with glass, which was unfortunate. But I was really happy to see people kissing the glass, at least. Um, so again, that, that the idea of passage of time and that sort of continual change um, of the monument because of human interaction and, and time. And these are some of the other, um, other objects that, um, that sort of probably filter somewhere else uh, in my brain. Um, this one is a, a saint, or I think it's the, the jaw and hair of a saint, and then the sort of sculpture built around it. This, these are both from uh, Vienna. And this is another um, particular monument in Vienna that's sort of um, really forgotten. Um, that It's now sort of plastered with stuff, um, like posters and things, and it's just in this really quiet park but it's this sort of overflow of flowers that's uh, you know, in this stone material that's just being slowly weathered by, uh, by rain and snow. And so again, that, that sense of material changing, the frailty of it really. I mean, the sense you know, that, that um, clay uh, is incredibly strong. I think it's one of the, one of the human materials that it, you know, if, if all humans disappeared for say 40,000 years. I think this is, I heard this once, that, that human teeth and, and clay and, and fired clay would still be around. So it's a, it's a really strong material, but it also shatters. So it has this like, um, as a material, this um, interesting juxtaposition. So this is, this is another one, another really uh, important experience and image for me that I carry around in my brain. This is a, a, in Steppensdom, which is um, the city uh, cathedral in Vienna. And there's this piece of limestone uh, in between the two main doors as you walk in, and that's just uh, people touching it for like the past 1,100 years or however many years, I think, 1,000 years or over. Um, and touching that same space, so just walking through and touching it. And so all of those I ideas are coming into this, uh, the construction of this, this fountain, and the idea of time and passage, and every time I, again, every time I show it, it's got more flowers. Uh, and I'm also really thinking about uh, these as landscapes, too. And I, I I feel like the ceramic work is just an extension of the drawing in the sense that everything is observational and, and constructed by hand, so it's all hand building. Oops, sorry. And this one is called uh, Circular Ditch, which is also in the exhibition. So again, conf configuring um, natural spaces into sort of decorative forms. This one is called Chime. I've also done uh, several works where I've, I've done one configuration, then I've changed it, um, and done another configuration, and then I've changed it. And this, this work shows up again um, later uh, painted. So it became a completely different piece. So I reserve the right to change things until, well, until someone buys it and then I can't. <laughs> um, and these are called topographies, topography one and uh, topography two. So again, an interest in, in Delftware and in the decorative, um, but also in uh, layering of image over top of object, over top of image, over, so it's just sort of this never-ending layering um, 
um, and creation of space. And I, I also have another series of uh, flowers that um, are uh, specific to a particular poem. Um, and it was coined by Rimbaud and Verlaine, and it was called a uh, um, sonnet to an anus. And in it, they, um, they liken um, the male anus to a purple carnation. So I'm doing these, this sort of never-ending series of carnations. And there's actually one in, in the fountain. <laughs> So again, shown in uh, several uh, different contexts. And I often link the, um, I have, um, I'm starting to work more with, with my own hair. Uh, and I'm, you know, thinking again about the, uh, the clay material as bone. Um, and the hair, um, hair is one of the things that after you pass away continues to grow for a period of time. And so there are, you know, certain reasons to sort of join these, uh, these two materials together. And this one was done in, in, um, in Vienna, and it was sort of in, in response to a yucky thing that the Albertina did. So they have Dürer's hair, or Dürer, Dürer's young hair, that beautiful watercolor um, of the, the rabbit. And they reproduced it like a hundred times all throughout the city in like fluorescent colors because they were deciding that they were going to display it because they they only show the Albertina shows it like once every ten years otherwise it's in like airtight like behind um, a vault and you get to see a facsimile of it so you th you may think that you've actually seen the original same with the the turf that really famous beautiful watercolor of the turf they have like a really it tricked me the first time I saw it. Um, a facsimile of it. And so they were deciding that, oh, for the you know, first time in 10 years, we're showing the hair. So they <laughs> made these three-dimensional versions of the hair, and they put them all around the city. So I just did this, this piece sort of in sad response. It's called Young Hair After Durer. <laughs> Are we OK for time? Or, OK, I'll just keep going. <laughs> if anyone needs to leave. Um, so I'm thinking about domestic objects and intimate interaction um, patterns of China. So these are a series of teacups. And really what's happening is the decoration is, um, in a three-dimensional way, decomposing the functionality of the dishes. So this one is called um, Wild Rose. Wild Rose teacup. Um, oops, sorry. And this one is... Buckthorn, I think, um, and Lily. So again, they're really, uh, it, it's hard to tell even that they, that they are, uh, sorry, uh, teacups and plates. But they're cup and saucer that are just sort of transforming in a, in a state of transformation. And then this is a teapot lid. And this is called uh, dandelion tea, dandelion teapot. So again, you can sort of see its structure as it's sort of um, decomposing or changing into uh, plant life. So there's the spout and then the um, the handle. But but very sort of abstract sculpture, really. It's And also, these were, these were really, ex um, they were experiments. I didn't think that they were going to work. I thought that they were going to explode in the kiln or do strange things. Or, and they, you know, like, uh, they, there are, you know, thicker and thinner areas. And of course, I, I knew that. And I, I wasn't expecting for any of them to survive. And they all did. Not, there were some cracks, but none of them broke or anything. So just the potential of the material and things that I'm told that I can't do and that I do and then I get away with it. I love it. <laughs> but I have, to, I have to sort of, again, give up control because I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and so these are, these are hand painted. So what do you use? Is it uh, watercolor? Or Acrylic paint. Yeah. And I, um, I use a lot of uh, different types of mediums and I also use a lot of water. So it is sort of, it's very watery and I, I layer them um, quite a bit. Um, whoops. 
So this is chrysanthemum teacup uh, and ditch. Oh, sorry. And ditch. Oh, where are we here? Oh, ditch plate, which is in the exhibition. So yeah, I'm. I'm again. This is another image from um, a space in Vienna, um, which they have a lot of polychrome there, and I started um, to get really interested in in painting and coloring um, the clay works. And so, these are. Um, this is called Root One um, and Root Two, and so my body or parts of my body start to reemerge in the work, um, and we have. And then there's bloom one, which you can't really see the, uh, the sort of penile element, which is in the center of the flower. And these works were, um, were, have just been shown in an uh, exhibition at the McMichael, and they became part of their um, collection. So they were uh, very soon after, so they were um, not available for the exhibition, but it would have been nice to have them here. Uh, but this is another work from that series, um, Root from Enigma. So again, re, um, sort of refocusing, changing the, the um, um, sort of stereotypical image or connection um, with um, the image of the penis, sort of um, cutting it off or, or taking it off of the body and presenting it um, sort of as a, as a flower of the body or a flower of the earth in a way. Um, and again, carrying on with, um, with hair, and in this, um, in this iteration, it becomes roots, so roots of the ground, um, but also roots off of my head. Ditch flowers. So this was an, um, part of an um, installation of work with Jane Byers from our exhibition back in uh, 2016, and this one is called Cut Flowers. Uh, from after Mary Delaney. So Mary Delaney is an English artist who um, is another artist who, I'm, uh, who I often uh, reference. And here it is in context with uh, Jane's uh, remarkable iron, a work sing, a cast iron. A bronze. A bronze, sorry, <laughs> bronze. <laughs> And another part of that, another um, sort of sculptural element of that exhibition was called um, Kitchen Wallpaper. So this was a, a piece that I did uh, site-specific for the exhibition that was in, in reference to my mother's wallpaper in her kitchen, which she told me at the opening she absolutely, utterly hated. And I always thought she loved it, and I loved it. <laughs> and, Uh, you guys, or how, did you it? It's how was that decided? <laughs> I can't, I think it was pretty, it was that was Taryn's yeah definitely Taryn's idea and also the idea of the of the pink I don't know if the image really shows it well but um, she just that shift to to painting the the plinth pink was really quite lovely I thought um, and then there was another small um, that that same root uh, root one was shown with Jane's remarkable drawing. So um, that was such a um, a lovely exhibition. I'm so happy, um, so happy that we were able to show together. And so another um, another series that sort of came out of my ceramic work um, were these. Um, works that I did installations with real f flowers um, where I covered entire walls um, and basically throughout the exhibition they decomposed. So I wasn't around for the decomposition so the gallerists really, <laughs> there's bugs in here and small animals and, <laughs> and it, it smelled, yes, which was all part of it, right? Um, oops. So this was actually the first one that I did, and this was in um, at a really lovely space in London. And the space actually has a really interesting history. Um, 
connected to the suffragette movement. And so I installed, um, I, I, I did a piece uh, based on the short story, The Yellow Wallpaper by Gil's, Gilman's Perkins. So I used only yellow flowers. And, and then over a period of the month of the exhibition, it, um, it actually dried really beautifully and became very you know, structural. It, when he took it down, he showed, he actually uh, videotaped taking it down and it, it just stood on its own. It was quite, quite wonderful. Um, but it sort of also looks a little, looked a little bit like chicken bones or so, or, or human bones even. Oh, so here's where that image is. So this is the image of, this is Wave Hill. So this is where I was in residence in, in the Bronx. I don't know why it ended up there. And I did a series of drawings that were based on um, configurations of flowers that I had put up in my studio and drew. Um, so sort of more conventional still life in a way. And presented them sculpturally. And these are works that are in direct reference to Mary Delaney, who is a, um, an English artist um, who um, did many things throughout her life, and she lived in the 17th century, and in her 72nd year, she started working with these paper mosaics. And she did, I think, just over or just under a thousand of them but by the time she died when she was 89. And they are tiny. They're, they're, so this one is probably about that big, maybe. And for instance, this is the, the passion flower has, I think they set around three to 400 individual pieces of paper. So this was at a time when colored paper was not readily accessible. So she would be hand dyeing these papers with natural elements and um, configuring them in a very sort of dimensional way. Um, in relation to you know color tone and uh, shape and value, she also at uh, times would put in uh, actual bits of flower or, or stem or um, or leaf, um, and so for me, I, you know, I consider her a collagist because that's that really is collaging. It's not what they uh, what you know is usually termed for her, which is paper mosaic. So I became completely fascinated upon seeing her work at the British Museum. And just you know, the, even the the dexterity and eyesight, and just the, um, the the physicality of these works, especially for uh, for someone to start at seventy two and you know do a thousand of them <laughs> over over a, a period of time. So I'm just gonna buzz through. These works are all um, based on um, my thinking around Delaney's practice. So this is pool one, and this is pool two, and this was installed in uh, an exhibition at the Textile Museum. And so I did a very long um, extended drawing so that it would pool onto the floor um, and be in reference to textile, but also to, um, I called them the pool drawings because they really were an exploration of space. And I was thinking about flowers just floating in a black pool of water. Um, so it's you know maybe even a bit funerary. Um, Sorry, and just a couple of other installations with the ceramics as well. Is that for you would be way too easier than the Well, these the imagery of these are cut flowers. They're also flowers that have been uprooted images of flowers that have been uprooted. So there there's several different sort of situations um, of, of the of the different flowers presented. So and some of them are, you know, uh, just naturally occurring on the sides of roads. So some of them are that way. Like there's, and down at the bottom, there's a, you know, there's Datura there. And then there's um, passion flower and um, there's a uh, thistle. So, but there also are flowers that you would, you know, maybe purchase at a, at a florist and give to someone or just have in your home. So there's many different sort of contexts for the, um, So this one was called blood cells. So again, thinking about the flowers in, in sort of microscopic terms as, as blood, or as blood cells. Um, I have a quote here that's, um, that I just would like to, to um, share with you. It's by George Gessert from um, a book called Green Light Towards an Art of Evolution. 
When we ignore the realms beyond consciousness, we ignore our connections to the larger community of living beings, most of which over immense spans of time have lived and died without once awakening. Plants are reminders of the structures that sustain consciousness. Plants are reminders of our forgotten selves. So I just thought that was such a beautiful quote. Um, and it's a reminder that, we're, um, that we often take for granted the fact that plants sustain us and they're, you know, we just take them for granted. So um, I really love that quote. So this is an, a, um, a reproduction of my drawing, Pool 2, that was used as the set uh, for a play at the Lincoln Center in New York. So I was approached by David Zinn, who's a, a wonderful set designer in New York, Tony Award winning, and I couldn't believe it. And, and he said, you know, we found, a, we found your work online and I created a folder and I, I just started um, collecting images and I had this project that I knew that my producers would love your work for. Um, so yeah, they, they did end up really liking, in particular, the pool series. And so they blew it up and it ended up the sort of central backdrop of the exhibition. So that's an, an example of how large they were able to um, make it. Um, so it was it was printed on this really beautiful linen, and then it was uh, and it was they sent it the, the files. So Paul was able to uh, Paul at um, um, Paul Petro Contemporary was able to uh, get really really high resolution images and then have it blown up uh, to beautiful effect. Uh, and they sent it away, I think, to somewhere in Hamburg to have it uh, to have it produced. And so that's the set, and it was starring Marissa Tomei, <laughs> and I got to meet her. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just had to throw that image in. Um, but it was a really, really wonderful play, and it was so great to have the the presence of the drawing. And one of the lovely things that Marissa said to me was that um, the drawing helped her get into her character. And I just thought that was so wonderful and generous of her. She totally did not have to say anything to me. So it was really wonderful. Um, another project that, that I did last year that was really a wonderful experience for me, very humbling, uh, was uh, I was commissioned by the McMichael um, to uh, make a commemorative work um, commemorating, commemorating the, um, the centenary of uh, Tom Thompson's death. So um, I worked in residence in the Thompson Shack on the McMichael site um, and created a seven by seven foot painting. So first time in a very long time that I went back to painting. But I wanted to definitely reference um, Thompson's material um, and the effect that that's had on the, on the Canadian psyche. It was also a very interesting person to get to respond to because there's so many different um, stories about, uh, you know, about his death and, and so much romanticism attached to that. Um, so I did a work from, you know, that I called, um, it was from the Pool series and I called it Pool for Tom on July 7th they pulled a wildflower from Canoe Lake. So, very long title. <laughs> um, and it was installed, um, and I, I consider it a sculpture, not a painting, so it was installed in the middle of the room uh, from July, from July 8th, so it opened on, on the day of his body being discovered 100 years ago, and it stayed up until September. Um, and then there were corresponding works in the gallery um, that were also commissioned for the exhibition, um, Tom Thompson, Joyce Wheeland um, exhibition that, that opened on the same day. So again, I'm just going to... So these are some of the details of the painting, and it's rather dark, so I don't know how well they can be viewed. And another series, again, that I will uh, continue in three dimension uh, that I'm thinking about at the moment are a series of wreaths. So I thought I would just show some of that series. And this was from a show in, in London in um, 2016. Wreaths and urns. So urns start to appear in the drawings. Um, this was a drawing called uh, Moonflowers, My Father's Skin. So it's related to an experience of my father's passing. Uh, he died of liver cancer and um, sort of at the moment that he died, his skin turned bright yellow, um, which is related to the, the liver sickness. Um, and so this is sort of a, 
a meditation on that experience, which, which was uh, profound and beautiful and also very sad. So um, thinking about color and, and, and body. Um, but I'm also thinking about uh, urns, um, which probably, once they're three-dimensional, won't have anything filling them. I'm also drawing on fabric. <laughs> um, and the last couple of slides are all from an exhibition that, that I did in, um, in Milan this spring at the Studio Museo Fran Francisco Messina. So this is a museum that's dedicated to the works of Francesco Messina, who is a figurative uh, sculptor, um, most active from the 50s to the 70s. Um, he purchased a church that was deconsecrated in the heart of Milan, and he turned it into his foundry, and um, he worked there until he died, and then he donated the collection and the space to the city, and it became a museum. And so artists, contemporary artists who were invited to exhibit there, have to somehow react to uh, or respond to the collection. So I did um, several uh, series of works based on particular sculptures. So this was you know, based on one of the um, ballerina sculptures um, and this skirt, which um, is potentially wearable, was just situated next to it. Uh, and then I did a drawing that's um, 11 meters. So it measures about 33 feet. And I sewed it together and then installed it um, from a very high, um, actually there were several different ways that we had um, discussed installing it and then none of those ended up being how I installed it when I got there. And I have you know, quite, a bit, uh, quite a smaller studio than I used to have so I did them in sections and I sewed them together. I never saw them together as one piece until I got them to the space. So it was a bit nerve wracking but you know, these are the things you do. Um, it's titled Nel Mezzo, Nel Mezzo del Camen de Nostra Vita, The Gate. So it's a quote from the Divine Comedy um, as he's uh, entering into hell or, or sort of descending in. Um, but materially the work is, the drawing is really related to the, to the collection of, um, of sculptures and the patinas on the sculptures. So I, I worked with very particular colors uh, in the creation of this drawing. So is it on paper? Or on it's, on, it's on black paper, yeah. So the, so the areas that are really light uh, that you see there are sort of silvery or bluish. Those are, that's just the black of the paper. And then the contrast is the, um, the pastel. How did you, and you sewed the paper? And then, yeah, so when I got there, I, um, I sewed the paper together, which was an entirely other um, experience, because it was, you know, it's 59 inches, so it's like four and a half or over four and a half, almost five feet. Um, so to, to sew it um, the way that I did, which was a, a, a cross, a particular cross stitch for structure, um, I actually had to prop it up onto, onto a table and sew from underneath and then on top and then underneath and on top. Um, but it, <laughs> It was the first time I'd ever sewn anything, so, um, well, you know, I sewed the odd button, but I'm, like, annoyed by having to do that, and it's, it's so, so it was quite an experience for me, but um, getting to respond to Messina's work, in particular to these beautiful figurative works, and then situate those sort of around the piece, um, and to work from, you know, a distance, obviously, I was working in my Regina studio and then transporting it to, um, to Milan. Um, but all of that, you know, all of that sort of um, shifting and growth in, um, in presenting my drawings uh, in a more sculptural way or in a more, um, I guess, um, yeah, in, in a more unconventional way is definitely related to my, um, my exploration of ceramics. And as I continue, they both enforce one another, or reinforce one another and, and um, yeah. And so this is the last slide. So thank you very much. I don't know if there are any questions. Zachary, I have a really practical question. Sure. I, when, when I'm seeing the work, I'm wondering, how do you track <laughs> these things? Yes. Uh, that's, the that's paper like... works and also the ceramic work. Um, the paper works are actually a lot easier to manage than the ceramics. Uh, the paper works, I usually um, am able to just roll them. 
Excuse uh, me, do you spray them or something? No, I don't fix my drawings because the surface really changes. Yeah. The sort of velvety surface just turns, um, how do I describe it? Like crunchy. Yeah. <laughs> like it crystallizes the, the, the pastel in a sort of, in, in a way that I'm not fond of. Yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in surface and the experience of surface. So seeing drawings not under glass and seeing the, you know, the way they were uh, pushed into the surface. So yeah, no, I, uh, my, my um, life-saving material um, that allows my drawings to travel where they do is glassine. So I just cover them with, uh, did you know this, the glassine, I've the paper? Heard of it, but I'm not sure yeah, it's a, it's a protective paper. It's uh, archival used, I think, mostly for photography. So, you layer but, that and roll it up. so I, 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 so for instance, this, this was rolled in one tube. Um, and I rolled them pretty tight, and it actually, they, you know, the paper's pretty good that I work with. Um, it's uh, either Canson or Fabriano, and, and it unrolls, and, you know, within a day or two, it's completely flat. Um, so it's very, yeah, both, you know, working on paper and working with pastel, uh, people think it's, in, you know, would be incredibly delicate, which it is, but it also is really hardy. And often the way that I work with pastel is I, I cover the entire surface with black, and then I work into it sort of like a painter working wet on wet. So it already has a surface and a lot of the color, you know, everything just sort of stays put as long as it is, has glassine on top of it. Yeah. And I've shipped them so, so many places and they've, you know, never, I've maybe on occasion had an issue, but that's usually with the works not being, not following my three steps, <laughs> which are, you know, roll it tight and then cover it with um, plastic, roll it with, into plastic, and don't let it shift in the tube. So that's the major thing, right? If there's vibration and it's able to go like this, there can be movement in material. So drawings, simple. Uh, and they go in PVC tubes, so that's you know, pretty, pretty much indestructible. I don't use the, uh, I used to use sauna tubes, like the concrete pouring tubes, but I don't use those anymore. Um, they're, they're like a, they're a little softer. They're still hold good structure, but I usually ship through FedEx, so I'm not, um, yeah, whatever. Sorry, FedEx. Uh, <laughs> but even, you know, even through a, you know, a, a proper art shipper, things can happen, right? So uh, with, the, with the ceramics, I, I hire out, <laughs> or I get really good ideas from artists I know who work in ceramics. But I had uh, beautiful crates, really ingenious crates made when I did the fountain. And actually, I made the fountain, installed it. I was sitting with Wayne talking like the day of the opening. He said, so have you thought about how you're going to transport this? And it dawned on me. I hadn't thought about it once. So um, with, a, with the um, wonderful assistant that worked for Wayne, who was a woodworker, she made these remarkable crates. And the, 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 the cup of the fountain, which has to, it can't touch any of the edges of anything, right? It's, it, the pieces are glued to it, so they would just snap off. It's actually held in place by two cylinders, and then it, it, it sort of sits in the crate that way. And thus far, and I've and I've I've create, I've sent it to Chicago, New York, um, you know, several places in Canada, and it's been fine thus far. So so yeah, and I, I the other works, the smaller works, I I tend to use Tupperware and. <laughs> So I don't have a like a genuine system yet, mm -hmm. but um, because it's in newer material for me, but I'm learning from the pros. I mean, uh, Clint Newfeld, who's a uh, really good friend of mine, has given me so much good advice and helped me out a lot in that regard. So. Where where do those poisonous flowers grow? Well, I think they're actually native to uh, the southern United States. I think Virginia, those areas. Um, but they, they thrive everywhere. They're really hardy and they're actually, their stalks are super meaty and they grow, actually, um, because they're really hardy, they can handle humidity and heat and, and um, uh, certain, you know, many different conditions that people are starting to put them in, in their gardens. I'm starting to see them everywhere. Um, and they grow really, really high. And they are, I mean, they are relatively well, not relative, they're pretty dangerous. Um, and so certain mus municipalities have made them illegal to grow in gardens. So like for instance, I think the city of Edmonton, you cannot grow them in Edmonton. So 
I don't know if there was a, you know, a, maybe a child fatality or, or a pet. I grow them in my kitchen, so I'm like super brave. And they seed out too, and I have to be very careful. But my cat doesn't go near them, so she knows instinctually. And she eats everything green. But I've sort of, I put it, I just sort of did a little experiment and, you know, would pull it away before she would bite, but she, she backed away and has never wanted anything to do with it, so. There could be, yeah. yeah. But I have also read that they're great in your garden for bringing the insects that you want in your garden, so. Yeah. <laughs> a little gardening conversation. <laughs> Um, where, do you know where that enormous blow up of your flower thing that was, do you know where it is? Yeah, or great question. So uh, after the show, I mean, I, I in, my, in my kind of contract about the image and, and its usage, I, I basically just said, I didn't say anything about, you know, where, you know, who would own it. My assumption is, is that the, um, the Lincoln Center would retain it and, and who knows, it would go into a storage unit maybe. But, my only stipulation was that it was not used again for another purpose. And, and if they did want, you know, maybe to use it for something in connection to the Lincoln Center, that they would have to contact me and ask me. But I actually recently, I, I have a show this fall um, with a New York painter named Ross Blackner, and all of the imagery uh, is primarily floral. And so I actually, I reached out to David Zinn and asked him you know, if I could borrow it for the show, because it's this, you know, massive, it would become a sculpture somehow presented, I have no idea. So he is currently um, checking out the situation of where it is, <laughs> so I don't know at this time. I mean, my assumption is somewhere in storage. I mean, it's huge. I couldn't believe it when I, you know, walked into the Lincoln Center that that was that they were able to do it. Like, it's, it's unbelievable what an incredibly high digital file can do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> We've grown to tour in our backyard here, by the way. We didn't know it was as dangerous as it was when we grew it, but it grew really well. Beautiful. Yeah. That poisonous flower, mm -hmm. did you say? Yeah, so. we just got it because it's beautiful. Yeah, we grew I it when our kids were little. It's and, it's, and it's yeah. also very, um, I had a, I I will say I had a kind of scary experience with it. They because they're trumpet flowers. If they're not sort of like this by the morning, like the sun sort of makes them droop. They sort of bloom at night and then and then they're done. It's like one evening uh, of glory. But sometimes they'll stay open, and if it's rain, they'll fill with rain, and they'll the the rain will just pool in there. And I had one sort of flop over, and the water fell on my foot, and my foot went kind of numb. And actually, it can cause that. I, so I, I was like, oh no, I'm totally paranoid. This is me just being paranoid. But no, it, was, it, it actually is a thing. Uh, that's one of the things that can happen. And also handling it um, a lot can cause tingling and things like that. So it's, uh, yeah, wash your hands after handling it. Yeah. yeah, we weren't careful with it at all. We knew you couldn't <laughs> eat it. We knew you couldn't ingest it. Yeah. But we well, and unfortunately, um, there are people who take it as as a recreational drug, mm -hmm. and it can yeah. it can keep you. It's not a it's not a hallucinogenic. It's a deliriate. So if it doesn't kill you, it can keep you delirious for up to a two week period. Uh. Who would want that? Wow. <laughs> and I know a person actually who told me that they, as a teenager, were hospitalized because of taking it. And cannot remember anything, but their parents tell them stories. <laughs> so yeah, it's not a. But for that reason, it also is interesting to me, I think metaphorically or narratively too. But, but also medicinally, yeah. perhaps. Absolutely. Actually, there's a long history of being. It's, it's used in, um, uh, in in asthma medication. I think it's still and in, in I think in an eyesight. Uh, Capacity, but it's also used to, for you know religious reasons for many different in, indigenous peoples, and they they knew how to use it and they knew the proportion. So you know that's not you know I had teenagers knowing I heard them having conversations outside my window and when I still lived in Saskatoon I had a little garden up front and I grew it and I said oh that's day two I'll wait till it seeds we'll come back and steal the seeds and I was pretty sure I mean they were like maybe fifteen to seventeen that that's you know what they were. I'm pretty good with the seed pods. I you know catch them right away because they produce more blooms. Um, anyway. <laughs> I could talk about day two for hours. <laughs> no, we haven't had the. Sorry. Day two.
Well, we grew it outside in our garden. Yes. Thank you. Oh my goodness. That was two hours. <laughs>